Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, we expect to have a few more folks calling in, but want to be respectful of your time. And thank you all so much for being here and for spending a little bit of time with me and our wonderful panelists who you'll hear from later. Just as we're getting going, it would be great to know um, who you are and where you're calling in from. So if you feel like dropping your name in the chat and your location and my personal favorite, your favorite wildlife, um, it'd be great to get to know each other virtually and see who all is here um, and really looking forward to an excellent conversation and we'll have time for question and answers and a lot of opportunity to engage with each other. So thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Abby Tinsley. I'm the Vice President for Conservation Policy at National Wildlife Federation. I've had the privilege of working at National Wildlife Federation for about four years now um, after spending about 10 years on Capitol Hill and it has just been the most rewarding experience of my life. So I'm so excited to be here and to be with so many of my colleagues who are gonna tell you about some of our fantastic key priorities for this year. Just making sure folks feel like dropping their, thanks Sam, I wanna make sure folks can drop their, their name and where they're from and their favorite wildlife in the chat. And we will get going uh, with a little bit more in just a second. All right, sorry about that. I had a little bit of technical difficulty. It looks like our, our chat might not be working for folks to enter that information in, but give it some thought and definitely channel your favorite wildlife while you're with us tonight um, and hearing from, as I mentioned, some of our esteemed panelists. So we're particularly excited to come together um, with you, our friends, our family, our, our Federation activists tonight, um, because here at the start of 2023, there is a lot um, that we have to celebrate coming out of last Congress. We had some really historic victories on the policy side from the absolutely unprecedented historic Inflation Reduction Act to the bipartisan infrastructure law, both of which um, were only good products, you know, thanks to, to our engagement and the, the engagement of all of you and making sure lawmakers knew that we wanted to center wildlife, we wanted to center communities and make sure that these projects are climate resilient for the future. Um, and we are very proud of, of a lot of that work and looking forward to what we can do in this Congress as well. Um, we, you will hear a lot of key priorities. Um, I just wanna let you know that these are, are not, um, not reflective of the full breadth of everything we do at the Federation because that, um, that would take about four hours and I don't think y'all wanna listen to us all that much, but we do have a phenomenal document that we just released our national policy agenda um, for the next two years. It is a really great all encompassing document that spotlights some of the key legislative priorities that we hope to tackle, including a wildlife friendly farm bill and the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, as well as just key values and um, central themes that really we embed across all of our work, including climate and environmental justice. So you'll hear more on a lot of these topics, but I wanna make sure if you have a chance um, and you want uh, to look in depth on any more of these, definitely take a look at our national policy agenda. It's a tremendous resource and we hope it'll be useful for you as you think about what you want Congress to do this year and how we can help. So first off, I wanna kick it since I mentioned that wildlife friendly farm bill, um, we are um, embarking on farm bill season and we have who I call our queen of the farm bill, our senior director of agriculture policy, Aviva Glazer, who I will turn it to next. Aviva, thanks for being here. Thank you, Abby. And I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about the farm bill. Hopefully um, my video is, is up okay and you can all see me. Okay, great. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about the Farm Bill. Um, this is one of the bills that you're gonna be hearing a lot about over the coming weeks and months and over the next year. The Farm Bill is a massive piece of legislation that covers all aspects of food and farm policy. Farm Bill policy helps to ensure that there's nutrition assistance to help feed the hungry. It helps to ensure safe and abundant food supply to revitalize rural communities. The Farm Bill includes funding for things like agricultural research, nutrition, crop insurance, forestry, and also conservation. 
when people think about conservation and bills in co Congress, the farm bill, you know, probably isn't the top bill that comes to mind, but, you know, really the farm bill is a conservation bill and the farm bill is a climate bill. The farm bill is America's largest investment in conservation on private working lands. Through the farm bill every year, there is $6 billion that's spent for conservation on farms, ranches, and forests throughout the country. In 2021 alone, Farm Bill Conservation Programs touched over 45 million acres, an area that, that is larger than the entire state of, of Oklahoma. So really the impact of these programs is enormous. These programs, um, to tell you a little bit more about what they do, they run through the US Department of Agriculture and they provide resources in the way of technical assistance and financial assistance to farmers, to ranchers and to foresters to enable them to adopt practices in their land, to make their lands um, you know, healthier for wildlife, to create enhanced wildlife habitat, to improve water quality and water quantity and to pr protect soil health. And that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like planting prairie grasses and prairie plants to support monarch butterflies and native pollinators. It can look like planting cover crops on cornfields to sequester carbon in the soil and to protect water quality. It can look like buffer strips that are planted along stream banks to protect native vegetation and to keep water clean and provide habitat for fish. So really this farm bill, farm bills in general are just critically important for conservation. And the farm bill's up for reauthorization in Congress. It comes up every five years. And this current farm bill expires at the end of September. So in the coming months, Congress is going to begin negotiations around this farm bill. National Wildlife Federation is working to get our priorities into this farm bill. We recently put out a series of recommendations and we can drop the link in the chat so you can check it out, uh, but very extensive recommendations on how we can have the 2023 farm bill be a very strong farm bill for wildlife and for climate and for people. And we believe that these recommendations will strengthen the farm bill and ensure that it works for farmers and ranchers and it works for communities and it has the best possible benefits for wildlife, for water and for climate. A few of the things that we're thinking about for this next farm bill, just to give you a little bit of a flavor and you're welcome to dig in more into the platform. But we're looking at, um, you know, I, I mentioned conservation funding and how it's the largest source of conservation funding for private lands. Even though it is the single largest source of conservation funding, there's also not enough. Every year, farmers and ranchers try to sign up for programs. They want to go to USDA and they want to adopt these practices and they want to do conservation on their land and there's not enough funding. There's just not enough funding to meet producer demand. Last year, through the Inflation Reduction Act, we had the biggest investment in these programs since the Dust Bowl, $20 billion for climate smart agriculture and conservation. We know that as Congress considers the Farm Bill, that funding is gonna be at risk. It's gonna be at risk of being, being stolen, of being taken to pay for other priorities. And so it's up to all of us to let Congress know that, that conservation is a priority, that climate is a priority, and that this funding is a priority and we need to protect this funding. We're also looking at how we can better protect grasslands and wetlands within the Farm Bill. Um, lots of provisions that we're looking at that would help to do that. And we're talking to members of Congress now on all of these things. There's many different Farm Bill conservation programs, each of which do different things. Uh, I'm not gonna get into an alphabet soup right now of all the different programs, but we're looking at each program and taking a close look and figuring out what are the tweaks that we can suggest to those programs to maximize conservation benefits. How can we make those programs work better for wildlife? How can we make them work better for water? And how can we make them work better for climate? And finally, and, and Sam, maybe go to the next slide. I have these listed here, yeah. Um, so finally, um, the other thing that we're looking at is how do we ensure equitable access to Farm Bill programs? How do we make sure that everybody can access these programs who wants to? How do we make sure that small farmers, that historically underserved farmers, that everyone who wants to have access to these programs can access them. So we're gonna be calling on you in the coming months to help us as we advocate for these priorities and your members of Congress need to hear from you. And we need your help to join us in this fight to make sure that the 2023 Farm Bill is good for people, good for wildlife and good for climate.
with that, I'll turn it back to Abby. Thank you so much, Aviva. And I know that was a short amount of time, but really, I mean, you hit on the breadth of opportunity and, and honestly risk with a farm bill. This is one of those pieces of legislation that it only comes around um, a little bit at a time, or you know, a few years at a time, but really for, for rural communities in particular, but since you mentioned the nutrition opportunities there too, it touches everybody in this country and, um, and certainly has a big impact on wildlife as well. Speaking of wildlife, you knew we couldn't go without mentioning our, uh, or spotlighting our middle name as the National Wildlife Federation. So next we are gonna hear from Mike Leahy, who is our Senior Director of Wildlife Policy on some of the big things coming up for wildlife this year. Mike? Uh, thanks, Abby, and greetings, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, all of our work is related to wildlife. And as the next slide will show, our mission is um, all about thriving populations of wildlife and restoring and recovering wildlife. And um, uh, sorry, I just um, was looking at a different slide there. Um, so this is the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, uh, which is super exciting, super successful law these past five decades. And so how do we celebrate that? Uh, one of the ways we're going to celebrate that is by trying to pass the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So you've probably heard about this act before. It's been our top legislative priority for a few Congresses, and we came within a hair's breadth of passing it at the end of last Congress. We passed it through the House we almost passed it through the Senate, and we're redoubling our efforts to do that this year. And so what this act would do is it would get funding to the states and the territories and the tribes to recover species in conservation need and to maintain them and their populations. And uh, so the states have been asked by Congress to come up with these state wildlife action plans uh, that are comprehensive for all species in need within the state. And the territories do the same. And then tribes have these tribal wildlife programs and projects that do an incredible amount of great work for wildlife. And the states have been underfunded for uh, decades as far as uh, their uh, species that are not hunted and fished in particular, and the territories have too, and then the tribes have received a very little bit of funding over the years to support all the great work they do. So this bill finally brings the funding that is needed to implement these state and territorial action plans for wildlife and to help tribes build out their wildlife programs and to implement the projects that they want to be working on. And uh, then a big part of that is also recovering endangered species. And so at least 15% of the funding from this uh, bill will go towards recovering species that are endangered and threatened. And then there is also additional funding in the bill specifically for endangered species at the federal level. And so that's um, a federal section of the bill that would. Um, would help to recover species and um, restore them to the point where they're no longer in danger or threatened. So uh, this has been a super exciting bill for all of us to work on. And we think it'll be reintroduced here in the Senate in a couple of weeks, hopefully soon in any event. And at that point, there will be a great opportunity for anyone and everyone to help get co-sponsors for this bill, and we think we might have an opportunity to move this bill through the Senate relatively quickly, so stay on guard for that. You'll definitely see action alerts and other materials, social media posts from us about this bill, because we expect it soon, and um, we would love everybody's help early on trying to get a lot of momentum, carry over that momentum from last Congress, try to get it through the Senate and first, and then We'll work on getting it through the House as well this year. And President Biden and his administration have expressed a lot of strong support for this bill. So look for that soon. Um, another area where we do a lot of work is wildlife corridors and maintaining wildlife movements. And we have had some real success here in recent years, thanks to the support of folks like you. We helped set up the first federal wildlife crossings program, $350 million. And that program is getting rolled out here soon and gonna be uh, 
implemented over the next few years. So there will be opportunities at the state level to implement that program, but at the federal level, we're turning to Congress and asking Congress to pass the first wildlife corridors legislation. So the crossings are uh, over and under highways. Uh, corridors are the broader connectivity areas and habitats that wildlife need to move around the country. And we're really focusing our efforts on the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act. This is something we've been working on with our tribal partners for a couple of Congresses now. And uh, we think this could be a good opportunity, this Congress, to finally get the tribes, uh, the resources and the technical support they need in order to uh, monitor and research where wildlife are moving on the reservations adjacent to the reservations and to um, uh, to then develop tools and strategies for keeping wildlife moving across roads, under roads. They've been leaders in this area and um, and just need some resources and help to do that. So Tribal Wildlife Quarters Act, keep an eye out for that one. And then um, uh, just a third area of work is going to be uh, kind of more species specific work and recovering some endangered species and getting them off of the list or help preventing them from needing to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. So one of the bills that we're expecting again here soon is called the Monarch Act. And it is focused on monarch butterflies and particularly the population in the Western United States, which uh, is in real trouble and um, has been bouncing around, but at a very low level in recent years. And there are plans in place in the Western states to recover and restore that Western population of monarch butterflies. And so that's something we're gonna be uh, helping out with and, and trying to pass that bill when it gets introduced here in a couple of weeks by Senator Merkley out of Oregon. He's the one who's leading that effort in the Senate. So keep an eye out for some action alerts. On the Monarch Act, there will be other opportunities and bills there is a wildlife disease bill that is we think will get introduced here soon and another bill that will help address invasive species and maybe some other individual species legislative opportunities but um, really wanted to highlight and flag those three um, top priorities for us this congress the cover america's wildlife act tribal wildlife quarters act and the monarch act so that's all i have thank you Thank you so much, Mike. And those are three really important priorities anytime, but especially on uh, you know the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. Just like what an amazing milestone and what an opportunity for us to really envision what wildlife can look like and wildlife recovery can look like in the next 50 years. That was that was a really wonderful encapsulation of a lot of the work that you and our wildlife team do. Um, next up, we are going to turn a little bit of a focus on uh, climate change, which is a huge priority of the entire Federation family and many of our affiliates, and I imagine it's something that you all think about, you know, on a daily basis as well. So we are going to hear from David DeGenero, who is our Senior Policy Specialist on Climate and Energy. David. Thanks, Abby, and thanks to all of you for being here. Really happy to be able to join you today uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, as, as Abby mentioned earlier, we saw some really historic winds over the last couple of years on the climate front, which is something that we've been working towards for a long time. So the bipartisan infrastructure law um, had billions of dollars for a lot of new technology like carbon capture and um, direct air capture of carbon dioxide um, and transmission lines, and as well as some some work on the ground for things like forest recovery and conservation. Um, and then the Investment Reduction Act was the biggest investment in climate in history. It has hundreds of billions of dollars in tax credits for clean energy generation, um, clean tech manufacturing here in the United States, um, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, as well as for a whole host of other conservation priorities. So really, truly historic achievement um, that we're very proud to be uh, of very intimately a, a part of. And thanks again to all of you for being a part of that as well and really making it a priority for members of Congress to pass that bill. So um, for this Congress, for the next couple of years, you know, we have a, a few areas of priority that I'll, I'll mention. Um, one of them is, of course, implementing those laws, making sure that the government is getting the money out in, in a timely and um, 
responsible manner. Uh, you know, there a lot of that will be working with the Department of Energy in particular and Department of Treasury as they work on the tax credits, um, sort of behind the scenes stuff that we'll be filing comments on and, and trying to work with the agencies. Um, but there may be some opportunities down the road uh, for some public input on those areas. Um, you know, in particular, where DOE is going to site specific, you know, direct air capture hubs, for instance, making sure that those communities um, are engaged and can really benefit from the development of that technology in their area. Um, and with the tax credits, making sure that everybody has access to the tax credits that, that uh, are available to them, whether that be for buying an electric car or putting solar panels on their roof or buying a new um, efficient water heater for their home. Uh, these are all available and we wanna make sure that people can take advantage of them. Um, and then the next area that we're thinking about is a relatively new area of work for NWF, which is uh, transmission. You know, there was a lot of investment in trying to get wind and solar projects off the ground and, and get those built so that we can have clean, renewable sources of power. But that power isn't any good if it can't get anywhere from there, from where it's generated to your household or, or business. So those transmission lines are really important. Um, and it's especially because uh, wind and solar are generated largely in places that are far away from where they need to be used. So the, the wind in the, in the country that has to um, produce power for the cities down, you know, probably a state or two away. So um, building those transmission lines is very complicated. It's, it's very tricky and we haven't done a very good job of doing that over the last uh, few decades. And the process for doing that needs a lot of improvement. So we're putting a lot of energy into um, working with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC. Uh, they're to, right now doing a lot of things to try and make that process move along more smoothly, but also make sure that it's respective of um, wildlife, the environment, and local communities. So be on the lookout. There's a, a currently a, 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 pro, a proposal out there to try and make that process run more smoothly, as I said, make sure that the federal agencies are meeting deadlines, um, and also for the first time requiring that they report on a project's impact to uh, not only just the environment generally, but specifically to tribal and local community resources, EJ communities, uh, and, and other important, and climate. They're, so they're for the first time gonna have climate implications in those reports. Um, so be on the lookout for that. We'd love to be able to get some uh, additional input from all of you. And then finally, um, wanted to just touch on, if you want to advance the slide, Sam, thanks. Um, some regulations that are coming up from the EPA. So the in, in, Inflation Reduction Act uh, got us, uh, will get us a long way towards meeting our climate goals, but we still need some additional regulations to help get us all the way there. Um, in particular, we're looking for a new regulation around power plant emissions. Uh, the Obama administration had put out a, a similar plan back a few years ago that was challenged in court. Um, and ultimately now we have to redo it and come up with a, a new one. So uh, we're looking for that to help continue to ratchet down emissions of not only climate emissions, but harmful other emissions from power plants. And that'll be a really important one to have public uh, um, weigh in on. And then additionally, we're looking at for a couple of vehicle emissions rules to come out. Um, uh, transportation is now the largest source of climate emissions in the United States. And so we really need to do more to tackle those in addition, you know, as, as we're trying to transition to an electric fleet. So the, um, the administration is going to put out some rules for uh, both climate and non and other harmful emissions from cars and trucks uh, within the next month or two. And we, uh, again, are going to look for some strong comments uh, on that rule to make sure that they're as strong as can be. So those are just a few of the highlights. There's obviously a lot more that we are continuing to work on, um, but I'll leave you right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I know you used the word historic, but man, across the Inflation Reduction Act and then looking at everything else that um, we have coming up, it is just, um, it is so much to tackle and, and so much at stake. So just really grateful for you and all of our other experts on the 
climate and energy team and across the Federation and all of you who will be weighing in on these really, really critical moments in time. Um, speaking of experts, up next is my new favorite colleague, one of my favorite colleagues to join the Federation family in recent time, uh, Dr. Adrian Hollis, Vice President for Environmental Justice, Public Health and Community Revitalization. Dr. Hollis, over to you. Thank you, Abby. I appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm going to talk about just three different pieces of um, legislation, but as everybody has already stated, that is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much. Um, I work at the intersection of environmental racism, environmental justice, public health, and uh, sometimes climate change, um, sometimes COVID, when COVID was at its uh, peak. So uh, basically anything that negatively affects the health of our communities. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the Donald McEachin Environmental Justice for All Act. The name was recently changed after Representative McEachin passed away, um, I think um, a couple of months ago. Um, as you see here, this is um, a photo of the first, um, excuse me, the first meeting that we held that um, um, Representative McEachin and uh, Chair Grijalva held around the Environmental Justice for All Act before it was even created. And the, the, the reason that I put that in there is because this is an important approach to engaging with communities, to have a meeting and talk to people about what their concerns are, right? What they wanna see addressed. Because the issue that I'm going to, that's going to be um, common to each of the three pieces of legislation that I talk about is the fact that traditionally communities have not been a part of the process and they've been overlooked, particularly those who are most at risk for exposure to hazardous substances or who are um, exposed at a higher rate to hazardous substances or people who live in rural areas, people of color generally, and so forth. So the Environmental um, Justice for All Act did several important things. First, it had a meeting and 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 created this. Uh, the act was developed with input from everybody who could participate. But it created advisory bodies and programs that address the disproportionate adverse human health or environmental effects that some federal laws or programs had on communities of color, on poor people, and or on tribal and indigenous communities, right? So all of these groups, and this includes people who happen to live in rural areas, which I think someone spoke about earlier. So the bill basically said that you can't discriminate on the basis of race, color, and national origin. I mean, we already know this, right? But we need a rule, we need a law. And if that happens, you have the right to sue you have the right to seek legal remedy and that's important it also says that agencies have to prepare community impact reports that assess the potential impacts of their actions you know anything that they plan to do or are doing and how it affects you know the the community at risk or the, the nearby community so um one of the things that you may say so how does that affect me and excuse that training whatever that is in the background. Um, the um, Environmental Justice for All Act also, and most importantly, or just as important, it establishes requirements and programs that can um, <clears throat> involve chemicals or toxic ingredients in certain products. For example, a lot of us women use cosmetics. And well, a lot of people generally use cosmetics. And we normally don't get a list of ingredients or warnings and um, the, the Environmental Justice for All Act addresses that lack of information. This is, you know, for example, if you buy food and it contains um, artificial ingredients, and that's the only information that's provided. Well, now that's against the law. It has been against the law because some of those artificial ingredients are known to be um, cancer causing. Another thing that this Environmental Justice for All Act does is that it talks about provide, it, it provides grants for research on how you can develop safer alternatives to chemicals that um, are present in certain consumer cleaning um, products, toys, or baby products, and those that are inherently toxic, right, to those, to those groups and that have been associated with chronic adverse health effects. 
that's important for all of us. Um, you, I think you've seen in most recently um, people sort of encouraging women, uh, particularly black women who um, have been getting these um, permanents um, and, and you know, using a number of chemicals in their hair. And these are cancer causes, cancer causing chemicals. So um, the Environmental Justice for All Act uh, um, addresses that. So it basically protects all of us. And so what we're asking, I think where you would could really help this is to help us, you know, get it to the point where it becomes law, where it's you know officially um, a law. Right now, it's an act. It's out of it's, it's, it has passed the House, but we want to see it become a law. And I think we need it to protect all of us. Um, the next thing is something I'm sure you've heard about, and I know David just mentioned. Um, but we talk about Justice 40, and people think that Justice 40 is money, and it isn't. It's um it's a it's a goal where the this administration has um decreed for lack of a better word, or made it a goal that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments go to disadvantaged communities. And those are marginalized, underserved, or overburdened by pollution. And again, that includes, um, that can be based on race, but it can be based on socioeconomics, it can be based on location, any of those. And um, when the president, President Biden signed executive order 14008, he committed to um, committed the federal government to at least putting aside 40% of the federal funds. And, and one of those um, pieces of legislation that in which we can benefit from that, you've already heard talk um, about, is the Infrastructure Investment in Jobs Act, or the IIJA, otherwise known as the BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And what this law does, it, it really talks about infrastructure and community. Why is this important? We've seen what happens when infrastructure is an issue, right? We saw that in Jackson, Mississippi with water infrastructure and the lack of water. I've seen it in Sand Branch, Texas, where the community has never been on water, on city water. They're 14 miles south of Dallas, and yet they've never been on, on water provided by the county. It's like a third world country there. And through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that is something that can be addressed. It'll help with inflation, which is a big issue for poor people. You know, and I, I can speak to that. My mom would probably uh, totally agree. She'd stand up right now and scream if she could, if she were here. But, um, you know, through this effort, it'll strengthen um, our ability to participate in, 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 activities that allow us to get money. Um, another particularly effective um, act is the Inflation Reduction Act, where $500 billion has been, has been put aside for new spending. Now, why are these two important? Because they provide fun funding for communities to now participate where before they were not allowed to participate. Why do we need you? We need you to ask for things like Oversight, we need to make sure the money is going where it's supposed to go, going to the communities that need it most, right? And we also want, I think that's something that you could ask for is transparency so we can find out where the money is going or where it's been to make sure that it is indeed going where it's supposed to. So I think there's a big role for communities to play here. And I hope that you know you can see that and, and please read all of these, take a little, their little fact sheets. And uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to talk more about it. Thank you very much and back to you, Abby. Thank you, Adrian. And I'm glad you um, uh, teed up questions. Uh, we're seeing a few pop up in the chat, but folks, if you have questions, feel free to drop that in the little Q&A box and we will um, do our best to get to you. And I know we covered um, a few really important and major topics, but you might have questions on other things the Federation's working on or just about how to engage Congress and the administration in general. Um, so feel free to drop any of those questions in the chat and we will um, maybe um, start. I saw a couple of comments on plants. So Mike um, Leahy, if you are still available to join us for um, a Q&A section, maybe is there anything that um, is on your mind in regards to how Congress can, um, can elevate the needs of native plants? Anything you wanna share on that front? Uh, you bet. First and foremost, this Recovering America's Wildlife Act uh, that I was talking about 
includes conservation of plants. And it does that in a couple of ways. Uh, one, it specifically mentions plants that are in that are needed by species of greatest conservation need. So basically habitat, but you know, wildlife uh, is dependent on habitat, and that habitat is generally plants or um, or involving plants. And so it does that in that kind of indirect way. And then, and that covers a lot of plants. And then it specifically includes uh, bonus funding for states that agree to work on plants and to conserve plants as part of their state wildlife action plan. And that, uh, you know, plants have historically been very underfunded in conservation. And so this would be a good start as far as getting some needed funding to plant conservation. There's a lot of other things that could be done. Certainly um, endangered plants are covered by the Endangered Species Act. And um, uh, Aviva may want to weigh in on uh, America, the Grasslands Act, which is uh, going to address a lot of native plants and um, well, a lot of farm bill programs as well. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that that could be done, but Recovering America's Wild Effect would be one of them. That is great, Mike. Thank you so much. A um, couple of other questions in the chat around, um, David, these are coming your way, around clean energy deployment and how we balance the importance of that with um, taking care of special areas that might be um, approached for mining and, uh, and wildlife as well, if you're able to speak to either of those. And Mike, I know you talked about connectivity too, so I'll let you weigh in there if you want to, but David? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we're, we know that we are going to need a rapid and uh, substantial build out of renewable energy resources, both in terms of the, the windmills and um, solar panels. And then of course, as you mentioned, the, the raw materials that go into those things, um, including steel and uh, critical minerals. Uh, so we're very much engaged in trying to uh, help guide and figure out how to do that responsibly so that we are avoiding places that shouldn't be developed. We are avoiding impacts to cultural and natural resources and wildlife. And when those things are unavoidable, um, you know, making sure that we uh, minimize the harm that's done. So we are right now, for instance, developing a report on developing renewable energy on public lands. So we'll be talking about the regulatory landscape of how that's done and, and what laws need to be followed, and then make some recommendations about how to do that, um, again, responsibly for wildlife and communities. Um, we are thinking about engaging in similar ways around critical minerals. Um, we, you know, we know that we do need to develop more of those here in the United States rather than relying on um, a, a select few foreign countries for those very important minerals. Um, so again, how we do that here responsibly. Uh, we have a robust offshore wind program and they've been very engaged as the administration has moved forward on a lot of different projects, um, working with both uh, the agencies, the federal agencies and the project developers, the companies who wanna build those uh, offshore wind turbines. Uh, to build in from the beginning into those agreements with those companies of all the things that they're required to do and that they're volunteering to do uh, to, to both um, avoid and offset impacts to wildlife in, in the ocean space. So it's, a, it's very much a work in progress. And as these things, as these new industries are developing, we have the opportunity to get it right from the beginning rather than trying to address problems later down the road. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. And that's a great opportunity. Adrian, I'd love to pull you back into this conversation. David talked a lot about community engagement and on the ground work, given your incredible um, experience and expertise. Do you have any advice um, for folks who want to get involved, not just at the federal level, but in, um, I know you talked about the Jackson water crisis and other issues in their backyard. Any advice that you'd like to share on community outreach and the ways to develop those good relationships like you spotlighted from Chairman Grijalva? Sure. Um, well, it's quite simple. Um, when I was, and I'll give you a quick example, when I was living in Tallahassee, my backyard flooded all the time and I started going to county and city meetings to try to get some, um, some, you know, some support, some financial support, because every time it flooded, I'd have to have it cleaned um, 
And that's the sort of thing we, you know, that I, I would suggest that you just start going to meetings and showing up and asking questions. And in addition to that, whenever there's an opportunity for public engagement, be it public comment, you know, the problem is that people normally feel like they don't have whatever you they think you need to, to comment, but you don't. All you have to do is be alive and be concerned. So participate in public comment opportunities and opportunities to, to speak out whether you know, whether you're doing it in writing or whether you're actually calling in or showing up now that COVID is, um, has decreased this efficacy, you know, just be involved. That is ex inspiring and excellent advice. Thank you so, so much. Um, and that's a great, you know, encapsulation and, and you all are already doing so much of that by just being here with us tonight. Really appreciate your engagement and conversation. Um, I think is we've hit you with a ton of interesting uh, topics and tease you with a few more. Um, I next wanted to turn to Tara Losoff, our Associate Vice President for Organizing and Campaigns, who can talk to us a little bit more about how to take action. Tara? Great. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks for our participants for joining us. Uh, and for everything that you have done and helped us to achieve here at National Wildlife Federation uh, so far. Uh, we hope you learned a lot today. And um, if you're like me, you might be wondering uh, what more you can do to protect wildlife in 2023 and beyond. Uh, and we'll be reaching out with um, lots of opportunities this year to engage with us through our usual channels. Um, but I wanted to highlight just four things today uh, that you can do. Um, number one is take action online. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do is to continue taking action with us. A lot of you are here because you're our activists and action takers. So when you see our emails, when you see our posts on social media, um, please do take action. It does make a difference. And as you heard um, from Mike earlier, we expect the reintroduction of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act very soon, maybe even next week. Um, and so when you can send a message to your member of Congress now, in fact, today, asking them to support that bill. Um, also, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is currently collecting comments around a rule that um, will regulate fine particulate pollution in the air, soot. Uh, it's a huge public health uh, issue that's affecting communities of people and, of course, wildlife um, across the country. And so if you haven't already, please take action with us to urge the EPA to make the rules stronger. Um, and then you can learn more about the process and the importance of administrative rulemakings uh, and the role of the public in influencing our environmental laws, as Dr. Adrian Hollis had shared with you, uh, is so important. You can join us and learn more. Uh, we have a training coming up March 29th on demystifying administrative rulemakings. And so we encourage you to check that out, sign up. And, um, and attend that and we'll have even more discussion. Um, a second thing that you can do aside from taking action with us is speaking to your members of Congress or your local representatives directly. Um, so you can call the US Capitol switchboard anytime and share or, uh, your support for any of the priorities you heard about today or other issues that are important to you. You can leave a voicemail. You don't have to even talk to anybody if no one answers. Um, I have this number saved on my phone is one of my favorite contacts, no kidding. It's 202-224-3121. That's the US Capitol switchboard. Uh, you can be directed to your representatives uh, or senators. Um, you can also meet with your members of Congress or their staff in person uh, at a district office near where you live or here in Washington, DC, if you plan to visit. Uh, and then for guidance on how to do those meetings, just you can check out one of the trainings we did last year uh, and, and it's really pretty simple and it's an important um, way to engage and, and shape a wildlife um, policy. Um, and then show up to local and county meetings as well like Adrian suggested earlier uh, at, so we can get involved at every level. Uh, a third thing that you can do is just stay connected with us. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation operates from offices around the country including our headquarters in Virginia uh, a National Advocacy Center in Washington, D.C. We have seven regional centers and satellite offices uh, everywhere from California, Montana, Colorado, Michigan, Louisiana, 
Texas, Georgia, Maryland, Vermont, and more. And we have staff and programs in many more places. Uh, and we also work really closely with our 52 state and territorial affiliate partners. Um, and they take the lead in uh, state and local conservation efforts. They collaborate with the National Wildlife Federation staff on many of the issues that you heard about today. So be sure to find us and connect with us on our website, on our national and regional affiliate uh, uh, partner, social media platforms, and uh, stay in the know about what opportunities there are to get involved. And then finally, you know, our work depends on um, a healthy functioning representative democracy. So that's why we need activists like you who participate in our democratic process. Uh, that means taking actions like the ones I described, but it also means making sure that you're registered to vote and voting in every election, state legislative races, city government elections, and federal elections. And you can also ask candidates that are running for office what they're going to do to protect wildlife and the environment that we all share uh, and the issues that are important to you. And you can find and share accurate information about voting with your friends and family so they can get involved and, and, and engage as well. And last year, actually, we were successful in advocating for our resources through uh, the federal budget for a website called vote.org. It's just an important nonpartisan tool uh, that provides accurate information on voting. Uh, so that's great news. Um, so anyway, those are just four things. There are so many other things that I know you've already done and will continue to do. And so for that, I just want to thank you again. Uh, and thank you for joining us tonight. And I'll turn it back to Abby. Thank you so much, Tara, for walking us through that. I was thinking about it while you were talking. I think I mentioned to you all, I used to work on the Hill and really every single one of those is how we help develop positions on legislation and how you would advise a senator. It's who falls in, who shows up, so up at those meetings, who's writing about issues. So I just, I can't emphasize enough how, how much that makes a huge difference. It doesn't take a lot of time. You don't have to worry about trying to be um, as expert as some of the my colleagues um, who you heard from today, it just takes a little bit of action. And, and you all started that journey by being here with us tonight. And with that, we are so grateful to have spent time with you. We do have a, a survey that we're um, going to drop in the chat too. If you can take just a minute to work on that with us, that'll help us adjust these for future events and just really make sure that um, that we're, we're you know, providing the information and the content that you need to get involved on behalf of wildlife and communities near you. So hopefully you will see that poll pop up right then and there, and I'm going to answer it myself. And if you have to leave us, just thank you again so much for spending time with us. Thank you to my esteemed panelists for participating. Um, we hope you enjoyed this event. We hope you'll let us know. We really, really hope you'll use it to take action. Thank you. And we'll be um, sharing around a recording of this. If you missed anything or you think your friends or neighbors might want to um, hear any of this, we'll share around a recording after the event. So make sure you check your email as well.